Welcome to The Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about one of my favorite operations and in fact one of the most successful surgeries we do in spine surgery called the anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. The anterior cervical discectomy fusion, anterior means from the front of the spine, cervical is neck, discectomy means taking the disc completely out, and fusion, attaching two bones to each other, making them one bone. An ACDF is primarily done to take pressure off of the nerve and sometimes pressure off of the spinal cord. So let's review very quickly what typically causes arm pain from a pinched nerve. So this is the back of the neck, this is the front of the neck and this is the side view there. So this is the C5 bone, C6 bone. There's a disc and there's a bone spur coming out narrowing this space. The space is supposed to look like that. You can see that there's a bone spur coming from here. The idea of an ACDF is that we take the disc out, take this big bone spur off the nerve to create an opening for the nerve. Essentially what we do is, if this is the neck, we take the disc completely out from the front of the neck, and after we take it out, there's a space, so we can't leave that space alone. So in its place, we put a piece of bone graft, or a cage, and then we put a plate, and this plate goes on, and we place screws through the plate into the bone, securing it into the bone, making it a fusion. The anterior cervical fusion has been around for over 30 to 40 years and is one of the best operations we have in cervical spine surgeries. It is also one of the most predictable and tried and true surgeries that we have. From a success rate, I usually tell patients there's a 90 to 95% chance of taking away some of the shoulder blade and arm pain, which is pain from the pinched nerve, and about an 80% chance of taking away neck pain. An anterior cervical fusion is better for treating shoulder blade and arm pain and neck pain and that's because the shoulder blade and arm pain is definitely coming from the nerve where neck pain can be multifactorial. How much pain we can take away depends entirely on how badly the nerve's already been damaged. We don't know that until we do the surgery but in general we can take away about half of someone's pain if not more. It is exceedingly unusual for somebody to come back after surgery and say that their pain is 100% better. There's always some residual pain. The purpose of surgery is to make somebody's pain better than it was before the surgery. An ACDF when done at a single level, meaning at one level in the spine, so if we just do one disc, takes about an hour skin to skin. That means from the incision to the last stitch. For two levels, takes about an hour and a half, and three levels takes about two hours. Patients typically spend one day in the hospital overnight just to watch for swelling in the neck because this is done from the front of the neck and there can be swelling and we wanna make sure that swelling is okay. We wanna make sure that patients can tolerate pain pills as well after surgery. Many patients get scared because they say, wow, you're gonna go from the front of the neck, that must be dangerous. In fact, an anterior cervical approach is one of the most bloodless and benign approaches that we have. If you look up and kind of push in the soft spot, which is in between this muscle here, we call this a sternocleidoid muscle, but this muscle here and the esophagus and trachea, there's a soft spot. And if you push, you'll feel something hard. You're in fact feeling the front of the spine right here, the carotid tubercle. From the skin incision to identifying the level of surgery takes only about three to five minutes. It's a very, very fast, very elegant approach. That being said, there are structures in the way, including the esophagus, the trachea, different blood vessels, et cetera, the chance of injury to those structures is less than 1% and is exceedingly rare. I'll show you what a typical incision looks like from an anterior cervical fusion. This is one of my patients and this is looking at her. So this is the left side of the neck. I make a left-sided incision. Some people tend to make a right-sided incision. Either way is totally fine. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but the incision goes from here to here. Here it is zoomed in. And I put a little pen mark here on the right and left sides of her incision. You can see that compared to a quarter, it's about the size of one and a half quarters. So very, very small, um, very not noticeable incision. This patient's about six months out and in a year, this one will become totally invisible. 
After we make an incision in the front of the neck, we go down and we try to find the front of the spine. If this is the front of the spine and this is a bottom up view, this is the diagram of what we typically see. This is the trachea and the esophagus. This is that muscle I talked about and this is the disc right here. So what we do is we come down and we identify the disc. Uh, we identify the front of the disc. There's a spinal cord. These are the nerves coming out and the bone spurs are here and here. We put these retractors in and then use small instruments, little burrs, little curettes to take the entire disc out. And then we use instruments to take the pressure off of the nerve and off of the spinal cord. These are very small one, two millimeter instruments. These are done under microscopic magnification. While we're taking pressure of the spinal cord, there is a chance of spinal cord and nerve injury less than one in a thousand. We are monitoring the nerve and cord the whole time with a neurological monitoring individual where they stick needles into different parts of your arms and legs and make sure that your spinal cord is safe during surgery. So they're watching your spinal cord even while you're sleeping. There's about a 3% chance of a dural tear, which is a tear in the covering of the nerve and cord. The nerve and cord swim in fluid and that fluid is covered by a thin sac as thin as saran wrap. If the bone spur or disc is scarred to the sac, the sac could tear. If the sac tear spinal fluid leaks out, it's not a big deal. We repair the tear, sit you upright for one or two days to make sure that there's no pressure on the tear and it delays your recovery by about one or two days. It does not change the ultimate outcome of surgery. After we take the disc completely out, we have to put something in its place. And there's two different options. One is something called structural allograph, which is basically donated cadaveric bone. And this is what it looks like. So this is literally bone donated from a cadaver that has been irradiated, meaning it doesn't have disease. So this is what it looks like. It's very small and it's about the size of a disc. So there it is top down and here it is up down. And what we do is after there's a space, we take this implant and we insert it into where the disc used to be. The other option is a plastic or metal cage and a plastic or metal or cage looks like that. Sometimes your surgeon will elect to use a cage and this cage often has a hole in it. There's the side view there. And the reason the cage has a hole in it is because it can be filled with some bone grafting substance. Now, when we use a cage, we take the cage and we place the cage inside and that maintains the height of the disc. The bone graft and the plastic cage are there so that the bone can grow through and through for a fusion. Well, fusion is a biological process that takes six months to a year, so we have to put in plates and screws to give it biomechanical stability to allow the bone to grow through and through. Once the bone is totally fused, the plates are useless. We don't take them out, but they are needed for initial fixation. So this is what a plate looks like. This is a two level anterior cervical plate and it holds, has holes in it for the screws to go in. So what happens is once we take the disc out, we then take the plate and we affix the plate to the front of the spine. And then we drive screws through these holes so that the spine has stability. Here's a really nice acrylic model of a single level ACDF. So there's a front of the spine and there you see the screws through the plate. And here's a side view where you can see here a plastic cage was used and you can see that the screws were driven into the bone there. When we put the bone graft, the plates and the screws, we use our experience, x-ray guidance, neurological monitoring, despite our best efforts. If there's a problem with the plate or screws, we'd have to come back to revise them. That's a natural consequence of leaving any hardware in the spine. It is exceedingly unusual to have to go back to revise any sort of anterior cervical hardware. I would say less than one in a thousand. Here's a good example of one of my patients who had a two level anterior cervical fusion. So just to orient you, this is looking from the side. This is the front of the neck. This is the patient's jaw, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. This patient had C5, 6, and C6, 7. I happen to use uh, bone in this instance and that's what this essentially is. So this bone was placed here in order to keep the five, six and six, seven disc space open and also to be used to aid in fusion. And this is the side view of this uh, anterior cervical plate. So 
This is the side view of the plate like that, and then the screws go in. After surgery, like all surgeries, there is a chance of infection, less than 1%. The biggest side effect of any anterior cervical surgery is difficulty swallowing. I don't even say that it's a complication because it's a side effect that we see in every single patient, at least for the first couple of days after surgery. You'll feel like you had your tonsils taken out because we did have to retract the esophagus. For the first couple of days, patients are drinking fluids, smoothies, applesauce, soup, etc. Most patients at the five to seven day mark had markedly decreased difficulty swallowing, and it's really unusual that I see a patient at the six we follow up where they do still have persistent difficulty swallowing, although it can happen. And because it is a fusion and we're relying on the bones to grow through and through, there is a risk of non-union, meaning the bones don't actually fuse. Now having a non-union is not always a problem because most non-unions are asymptomatic, meaning if the bones don't successfully fuse, that doesn't always translate to problems or pain because it can sometimes be a fibrous non-union, which means instead of being bone through and through, it's very fibrous tissue, so it's very stable and very solid and is therefore asymptomatic. However, if you do develop pain from a non-union, we would have to go back and place little screws in the back of the neck and these little bones here to attach them. That gives biomechanical stability so the front of the spine can fuse. That's called a posterior cervical fusion. The rate of non-union, which remember doesn't always translate to additional surgery, is pretty high. It's about 10% for a single level anterior cervical fusion. And obviously as you go up in the number of levels, that non-union rate goes up. So for a two level, it's around 20% and a three level around 30%. Patients always tell me they don't want a fusion because they don't want their neck to be locked in place and walking around like a robot and feel super stiff. Interestingly, if you fuse one or two level in someone's neck, they have no perceptible loss of motion compared to before the fusion. When you fuse three or more levels, then you start getting a little bit of stiffness. Something to understand is that this is the front back view of your neck and at the C1, C2 level, which is the no motion, there's 50% of rotation. And at the base of the skull in C1 level, which is this and here, which is the yes motion, is also 50% of flexion extension. This in fact means that if you fuse someone's entire cervical spine, meaning if you were to fuse someone from here to here, which is highly unusual, just maintaining the base of the skull in C1 and C1, C2 would maintain 50% of your range of motion. There is something called adjacent level disease, which we should talk about. By fusing one or two levels, there's no question that some pressure is placed on the adjacent level. For example, in this patient, because we fuse C5, 6, and C6, 7, the level above is gonna take up a little bit more force and the level below is gonna take up a little bit more force. In general, there's about a 3% per year chance if you take a snapshot x-ray every year of somebody that had a fusion that they would have degeneration. That means that 10 years there's a 30% chance of having degenerative changes above or below the fusion. Of course, that means there's a 70% chance you might not. Now, not all those patients are symptomatic and not all those patients need surgery. Ultimately, only a third of those need surgery. So really, the rate of adjacent level surgery, meaning needing another surgery because you had a fusion is about 1% per year per level. So at 10 years, a 10% chance of perhaps needing revision surgery at the level above or below the fusion. Adjacent level disease is a natural consequence of fusing the spine. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a fusion. It just means that you should be aware that there is a potential of developing some adjacent level disease. Remember Peyton Manning had a couple of failed posterior surgeries before having a successful two level ACDF and he won the Super Bowl after. So if it's okay to play NFL football after you're fused, then it's probably okay for you. Postoperatively, I do require my patients for a single level to wear a soft cervical collar, which is a foam collar for six weeks for a one level surgery. And for a two or three level surgery, I require a hard cervical collar, which is plastic for 12 weeks. I typically start physical therapy at around the 12 week time, no matter how many levels we fuse. And at four months, I let patients go back to the gym. Actual biological fusion, meaning the bone actually growing through and through and being stable and solid takes about six months to a year. I typically don't let patients do impact activities, high level activities for at least six months. And sometimes we even get a CT scan to make sure they're fused before we let them do extreme sports. 
90% of patients are fused at a year, and almost all patients, if they're gonna fuse, are fused at two years. And once the spine is fused and solid, you do not have to worry about that level at all. You don't have to worry about anything else recurring at that level. So an anterior cervical fusion is one of the most successful surgeries we have, one of the most time-tested surgeries we have. An anterior cervical fusion is one of my favorite operations to do for this reason because the patients do really quite well. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Hopefully you learned a little bit about an anterior cervical fusion. Feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.